God community. Yeah, so people have been saying that Ryan and I look like brothers, and because I'm 25 years older than he is, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> I also told him, hey, look, you know, because we look alike, as you're out there in the community, dude, you better represent me well. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Additionally, if I do anything dumb, I'm gonna blame it on you. All right? That wasn't me, it was Ryan, so... Hey, I want to say thanks uh, for hanging in there with us through this remodel journey. We're about halfway through now. December 15th is our target date to have 90% of it done, but we're about halfway through there. You know, the light's not perfect, the sound's not perfect, but you guys have been great. If you notice where the carpet is missing, like right there, that was the front of the stage. So the room is growing quite a bit. You can see where the speakers are hanging. Now they're like in the middle of the room. So there's a lot that these guys have been trying to put together and backfill to keep us going. But I appreciate you guys and kind of putting up with it. But like I say, we're halfway through now. So continue to pray for uh, this project and that God would go before us. Good news is everything is going according to plan. So we're super thankful for that. So if you got your Bibles, we're in Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna pick up where we left off last week. We're gonna finish out this amazing, amazing chapter. And I'm reminded of a story told by C.S. Lewis in the book, The Great Divorce. A story about a, a ghost who has on his shoulder a little red lizard. And this is the ghost of a man who once lived. And this little lizard is constantly speaking to the man. And he's telling him things, whispering things in his ear that are not in the man's best interest. And this little lizard represents his temptations. Suddenly, an angel appears. And the angel tells the man, I can get rid of that lizard for you. I can kill it. And the man responds by saying, no, no, wait a minute. Um, We know each other. I've become familiar with the sound of his voice. And he tells me what to do very often. The angel says, yes, but you know, when he speaks, it's not in your best interest. Kill it. Give me permission, and I will destroy it. And once again, the man says, "Uh, I don't know. I mean, what would it be like to not have that voice in my life. It's been years. The angel responds with, in this moment is every other moment. Meaning, if you act decisively right now and you put that voice to death, it will influence all other moments in your life moving forward. Kill it! the lizard recognizes that his life is in danger, so he begins to whisper. You and I have been friends. We've been speaking to each other for so long. I promise from now on, I will give you only good dreams. You can trust me. Have you ever fell into that pattern where you've done something It just doesn't feel right, but you do it anyways. And then afterwards, you say to yourself, I will never do that again. And you find yourself doing the same thing years later. In a very real sense, the Apostle Paul says, Christian, there is something you must put to death. You must act decisively because this moment contains all moments. The Apostle Paul has been talking about two paths in life. There are only, really, there are only two. He uses the word walk to describe it, which means the course of one's life. Two paths. One is laid down by God and his truth that leads to godliness. There is another path that is laid down by man and his own thoughts, which is worldliness, and it robs you of your life. And he says there are these two paths that you can go down, and each path will determine the course of your life. 
Christian, which path are you on? Chapter four, verse 17. Now this I say, and I testify in the Lord. So in other words, what he's saying is, these aren't my own words, but what I'm about to tell you, these are the things that I've actually heard from Jesus himself. That you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Don't live your life as the Gentiles. He's using the word Gentiles to refer to those who don't know God. Don't live your life as those who have no knowledge of God because you see there's a futility of their minds. Futility means usefulness, even in their thoughts. A life lived apart from God, you end up having useless thoughts. He'll flesh that out in a moment. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. This is the language that Paul lays down in Romans chapter one. We're gonna talk about that in a second. He goes on, verse 19. They have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. He contrasts these two paths and he uses a very emphatic statement. The Greek word translated as you must, I'll give you the, I'll give you the Greek pronunciation of the word, see if you can spot its English equivalent. You ready? Martyreo. Martyreo. What does it sound like? What English word? Martyr. This is in the emphatic language. Paul says, Christian, there's something you must put to death. There is something you must kill. In this moment is every other moment. There's that little reptile that's speaking into your ear and you've been listening to it. Put it to death. Put it to death. What is this old way of life that we must die to? Well, he describes three things, and he nails it. Number one, he says, formerly we had a darkened mind. The Bible is not neutral when it comes to the mind of man. It's not neutral. It describes the mind of man as being corrupt. In other words, you and I have this overwhelming disposition to do what is in our best interest, selfishly, apart from the effects on others. This is the reason why you and I have, in the past, perhaps even now, we will intentionally do things to harm the very people we say we love without answering out loud. Have you ever done that? Have you ever intentionally meant to do something harmful to someone that you say you love? love. Like, where does that come from? So it's humanity's overwhelming desire to put ourselves on the throne and take God off the throne. So this is a bad trajectory. Paul says there's two ways you can walk, like the Gentiles who are godless or like those who are in Christ. Secondly, he says, we had hardened hearts so the battle begins in the mind. The Bible says as a person thinks, so, so they are. Then it moves into this hardened heart. So when you and I repeatedly make wrong choices, what happens is, there is a, um, there's a deadening to the things of God. Uh, this is why you find yourself in a place sometimes that you never thought you'd be, right? It's like, I never thought I would take this action, and the first time I committed it, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. I'll never do that again. And then you repeat it, and you repeat it. And all of a sudden what happens is, it's like not only do you feel like you, you, you need your soul scrubbed clean, but you become desensitized to the things of God. It's like a calloused heart. So there's a little formula that Paul puts together here. When you combine a darkened mind with a calloused heart, it will always lead to the third thing he lays down, and that is a reckless life. And here's the description. Giving themselves up to sensuality. You know, it's really, really interesting because very often when Paul describes a life apart from God, you know what the first indicator is? Sexuality or sensuality. <laughs> that's literally what, that's what follows. In other words, he says, one of the first things that will overtake you as you follow down, as you follow a path that is apart from what God wants from you, it's going to manifest itself in some form of sexual brokenness that will come into your life, but you don't realize it. Everybody in this room has some measure of sexual brokenness, period. Why do I say that? Just in terms of the influence of pornography alone, sexual brokenness has been brought into our lives, and we all have suffered as a result of it. 
Isn't that interesting? We'll see this flesh out again in Romans chapter one when Paul says, as people deny that there is a God, something manifests itself in their lives very, very quickly. What is it? Sexual perversion. That's what he goes on to say. That's the first thing he mentions. And here he says, so you have, you have a darkened mind and you have a calloused heart. Those two things together will always lead to a reckless life, which very often manifests itself in sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. This is what I refer to as the insatiable life. This is the hedonistic problem, by the way, right? Think this through. But you know, the word insatiable means that it can never be, something can never be satisfied. This is the hedonistic problem. Because once you go down this road, it's always a little bit more. You always need something beyond what you've had in order to obtain the same kind of stimulus as before. That's, that's, that's the problem for the hedonist, right? It, it's never enough. I'll just give into it just this one more time, and that's it. This is why very often in the Christian life, there's this cycle of sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent, and the years go by. It's like that ancient proverb. Two dogs are fighting, they're waging war within you. One is for your good, the other is for your destruction. And you ask the question, well, which one is winning? The answer, the one you're feeding. Paul lays down the same principle in Romans chapter one. He says that people reject God not based on the evidence for God, but because of their darkened lifestyles. Verse 18, for the wrath of God, stop. You do realize that God exhibits the emotion of anger. Why is that? Because God cares deeply about his creation. <laughs> he cares deeply about justice and injustice. And so all the wrongs in this world, God does not ignore. He's upset at those things. The problem is humanity is the source of those wrongs. See, that's why Jesus came to placate the anger of a holy and righteous God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Righteousness means doing right deeds. Unrighteousness means doing all the wrong deeds. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So this is really interesting. What he says is that there is a truth about God that can be known, okay? But what happens is people suppress that truth. They try to, they try to hide it. It's like, have you ever been in the pool and you've got a beach ball and you try to hold that, that ball underwater? What happens? It just wants to pop up to the surface. Well, he says, humanity's kind of like that. There's this truth about God that can be known, but men keep that truth suppressed. How so? Because of their unrighteous, ang uh, their unrighteous actions. What, what is he talking about? Simply this. If there is a God, he's holy, he's just, he probably has something to say about how I should live my life and what will give me life, and I'm not sure I agree with that. And because I don't like people telling me what to do, it's easier for me to dismiss the, the, the idea of God or the existence of God. So I'll just live my life as if there is no God. I'll be a practical atheist. And Paul says, you're trying to keep that truth of God submerged, but God has baked into the fabric of reality his existence. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Even the people that wanna deny God's existence, how so? Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, okay, God has amazing power. That's what I love about monsoon season here, man. You just get your lawn chair out, make sure it's plastic and not metal. You sit in your backyard and you watch those, those thunder clouds roll in. It's like, and you're like, man, that is power. God has a divine nature. What does that mean? God supplies oxygen to the very people that deny his existence. He keeps them alive, okay? Divine nature, having been clearly perceived, how do we know these things about God? How do we know God exists? Ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So the people who deny God's existence, they're without excuse. Now remember, why are they denying God? Because they wanna keep that truth suppressed just, let's just remove God from the picture so I can justify my lifestyle. 
the new atheists are losing their voice when they first came to prominence a couple decades ago, they were a force. The problem for them is the, is the science. <laughs> uh, as science progresses, we understand more and more the complexity of creation. And the more complicated the design, the more intelligent the designer. When some remote tribe is found somewhere in the world, there's every, they all, so far, they all have been known to worship. Did you know that? They all worship. What do they worship? Well, they worship the created thing instead of the creator. This is why when a missionary is sent to them and they realize, hey, you're worshiping the, the rocks and the trees and the plants, but let me tell you about the God that created them. But we're all worshipers. We all worship something. To worship is to ascribe worth to something. We were made to worship. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, that's the same language that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter four. Now, all of this uh, could, and by the way, what follows next, if we were to read it, is the manifestation of this fallenness, of this darkened mind and futility of mind, darkened heart and futility of mind, is, is the outworking of sexual brokenness. All of this could make you think that Paul has a rather pessimistic view of the world and of people. And in my preaching over the last three decades, I have been accused of being pessimistic. Not so much in the last five years. I don't get that critique anymore. And you know what that is? The world is so jacked up that when I talk about humanity being the problem, pretty much everybody now is like, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, that's right. The world has become so dark. People are looking for the smallest little glimmer of hope. If we were the solution to our problems, everything would be fixed. But most people on the planet agree that humanity is not progressing towards some better idealism. In our Kent Hughes' commentary on Ephesians, he says something really, really profound. If you've been raised in the church, you might have some friends who have deconstructed their faith. You know what I'm talking about? People that are questioning their faith. And it's good to question your faith. You know, you, you should, you should. There's a great story about this guy named Doubting Thomas. And I, 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 I don't refer to him as Doubting Thomas. He's more of like the empiricist of the group. You know what I'm saying? He's like, I need facts. Like, give me facts. Is it you, Jesus? Is it you, Jesus? I need some facts. Show me. Show me. That's awesome. That's good. If you read through the Psalms, David is really wrestling with God. He's like, God, are you real? Are you there? I feel like you're distant. You don't wrestle with something that you think doesn't exist. So many have questioned their faith to the point that they have deconstructed it and they have ignored what is actually the hard anchored root and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says, let's go back to it, there's more evidence surrounding the resurrection of Jesus than just about any other historical event in, event in history. And if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then Christians should be pitied, we're foolish, we're naive. But Paul says, go back and fact check it. Go back and look at the evidence. Why is Christianity a thing? Why is it here? It shouldn't even exist, you know? It shouldn't exist. Something happened 2,000 years ago that caused the early, early followers of Jesus who were Jewish to bend the knee and worship him as if he was God. That's blasphemy, unless you say, destroy this temple in three days, I'll bring it back. You do that, even his closest followers doubted him, right? Because they're all huddled together in an, in an upper room. Thomas doubts that it's even him. They all scatter upon his arrest, right? And then he shows up, the resurrected Jesus, and they're like, game on. He did it. So. If Jesus said, destroy this temple, in three days I'm coming back, and he proved that to be true, everything else Jesus says is true. About himself, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That sounds so horribly exclusive in our modern time. What gives him the right to do that? Resurrection.
R. Kent Hughes says this, a loss of the biblical vision of the world is behind the erosion of Orthodox Christianity in many places. He's exactly right. We have lost a biblical vision of the world. What does that look like? Well, I'll tell you, in part, it's, it's supplied by, by the church, by you and me. Because what happens is, by living out our faith, we bring the kingdom of God to this planet. And it proves to be such a salve. You read through the Sermon on the Mount and all those, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. You bring that to this planet and the world looks at you and goes, what is different? About That's why some commentators, when they, read, when they read through Ephesians, they're like, you know what Paul's describing? A new humanity, a different race, Christian. Because if you imagine the world is better than it is, the necessity of Christ and his cross is lessened and the potential of unregenerate man is elevated. Again, he nails it. This is why I, like the other biblical authors, we are constantly pointing out one of the most easily verifiable truths of the Bible is that men and women sin and that's why the world is in such a desperate state. Now for a new experience, verse 20. But that is not the way, you Christian, you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. We've got to camp on that for one second. Sin is deceitful. Your desires are deceitful. Uh, it's always the sugar coating and never the, the, the cavities. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Righteous and holiness. So here's what Paul says. He says, change your thinking and change your wardrobe. Do you consider yourself to be stylish? Do you consider yourself to be fashionable? Paul encourages you to think about what you wear. A wardrobe. Change your thinking and change your wardrobe. But before you put on new clothing, you have to take off the old. This is easier said than done because the old is so familiar and it's so comfortable. Even though it's destructive, it's familiarity. This is why people keep going back to damaged relationships because it's so comfortable. It's what we know. And then after a while, you don't realize this is jacked up. You gotta take that off. You gotta take off the old and put on something new. So I, I, I have a couple of T-shirts that, well, I realized a while ago, these T-shirts I've had longer than I've had my oldest child who just turned 28. These T-shirts are three decades old. And Jill and I have a pretty good marriage. But these shirts have been the source of marital conflict. <laughs> like I see some dudes looking at their wives, right? Right, you understand what I'm saying? All right, I'll speak for you. So on more than one occasion, I have pulled these t-shirts out of the trash. <laughs> and I'll put it on. I'm just like, man, this thing feels so good. Like, why don't they make T-shirts like they did 30 years ago, you know? This thing feels great. Oh. You know, and you even look at it, and you're like, I look good in it, you know? I look good in it. And then you wear it out there in the world, you know? Like, you're going to Home Depot, or you're going shopping or something, and then you look at people, and they're like, side-eye, and you're like, you're like, why are people looking at me? And you realize, oh, no. Maybe it doesn't look so good. Maybe I've been deceived into thinking it looks better than it does. It's kind of like when you have those dreams where you go out in public wearing your pajamas or in your underwear. People are staring at you. But it feels good. It even brings back memories. You go home and then you really evaluate it. You take a good look at it in the mirror and you're like, this is hideous. <laughs> this looks awful. I have these beautiful clothes in the closet. 
Paul says, you know, Christians, sometimes it's just a moment of really good evaluation that takes place where you look in the mirror and you see yourself as you really are and you say, that's old life. That's old life. I gotta take that off before I put on what's new. So what exactly are we taking off? Well, the things that are common to all of us, verse 25, therefore having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why? Because we're members of one another. Stop lying. Why? Because lying erodes trust. I think of the philosopher who said, oh, I'm, I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm just discouraged because now I can't trust you. And trust is one of the key pillars of any relationship. Then he says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sin go down. Do not the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. This is really interesting. It, apparently it's possible, it's possible to be angry and yet not sin. Jesus is, is an example of this. Jesus rolls up on the temple and he sees the money exchangers and they're taking advantage of people. In order to pay the temple tax, you had to use temple currency. And so you would take your money, your shekels, and you would, get in, you would exchange them for the temple currency and then you could pay your temple, temple tax. And so what was happening is these money changers were taking advantage of people. They were there just to worship God. And what does Jesus do? He gets a bit violent takes the table, overturns it, he drives people out, and everybody's like, wow, you know, and what does Jesus say? I'm upset because this is my father's house, and you're turning a profit off of it? It's like, I'm not gonna let that happen. So here's what you have to do. Don't let the, sin, don't let the sun go down on your anger. What does that mean? Deal with it quickly, why? Because when anger is held, it becomes personal. And when it becomes personal, it turns into revenge. And when it enters the area of revenge, what happens is you, you become the skeleton at the feast and you don't even know it. In, in, in other, and then you give the opportunity to the devil. It cuts both ways. Because what happens is he will use your anger to demolish somebody else. Meanwhile, you're demolishing yourself. You, you are the skeleton at the feast and you don't even realize it. You're devouring yourself. That's, you give the devil an opportunity if you don't deal with it. So you, you have to check yourself and say, what is it that's making me angry? Anger is a God-given emotion to correct a wrong, but in the right way. What makes me angry is very different than what makes Jesus angry. You know what, one of my hot buttons is rudeness. I can't stand rudeness. But you know what's at the core of that? My pride. How dare you treat me like that? You follow? See, what am I defending? I'm defending myself, my own pride, my own ego. That's what hurts. It was never this way for Jesus. Deal with your anger soon. Recognize first, why am I angry? And then what is God telling me? How do I correct a wrong but in the right way? Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. There's more than one way to steal. Some cheat on their time cards. Some cheat on their taxes. Paul says, just do honest work. Why? Because in doing honest work, you actually will be a blessing to other people because then you can generate revenue which can be used to bless those who are poor. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. James says that this little thing, very small part of the body, but incredibly destructive. Do you realize that world wars start over words? This is, it's like a little spark that sets ablaze an entire forest. There's a fable about a young girl who slowly, over time, begins ingesting small amounts of poison. Until finally she finds herself walking in a field of flowers. And she inhales, takes a deep breath of what's around her, and she exhales. And to her horror, all of the flowers die. Just a little comment a little falsehood, a little deception. And what happens is you begin to rob the lives of the people around you through your words. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the, for the building up that would be encouraging as fits the occasion so that you can give grace to those who hear. Proverbs eighteen twenty one: death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it 
will eat its fruit. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In ancient times, when someone made a purchase, they would place their seal upon it as a symbol of ownership. In Ephesians chapter one, Paul says, Christian, you have the seal of the Holy Spirit upon you, which means that you've been purchased by God through his son, Jesus Christ. So the question is, well, what have we been purchased from? The Bible tells us that we were, we were all slaves to sin. We've all experienced slavery to sin. And so, as a slave, you come up for auction. What is the price? Life. The wages of sin is death. Well, we all operate, right? We're all sold into slavery as, as sold into the sin of slavery, and so, the wage to buy us out of that is life. You have to give life. And so this is the reason why Jesus died as a propitiation, which is a big word that simply means payment for our sins. That's the reason why Jesus had to die. Sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. I think the Holy Spirit is the most misunderstood member of the Trinity. Many view him as little more than an entity, kind of like the force in Star Wars. But here we're told that it can be grieved, can be grieved, which, which indicates intellect, emotion, and will, personhood. What is it that causes the Spirit of God to frown? Verse 31, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and all malice. It's a summary of everything that's been said before. Put those things off. What do we put on? Man, be kind to one another. It's been said, if you want to change the world, don't hammer it with your words. By the way, this is election season. God sits on the throne. He causes nations to rise and fall. Christian, our charge is to be kind. If you want to change the world, don't hammer it with your words, but melt it with your kindness. Be tenderhearted. Forgive one another. Well, to what extent? as you've been forgiven, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Can you give me an example of that? Sure, you ready for it? It's the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ. That's what it took for you to be forgiven. Now forgive one another. What's the takeaway? Well, let's continue with the lizard metaphor. We can ask the question, are we Christian chameleons? Do we absorb those elements of the culture that define a different path than the one that gives us life? You know the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat, right? What's the difference? What, what does a thermometer do? Well, a thermometer just measures the temperature that's around it. But what does a thermostat do? It changes it. It changes it. This is the power of the Christian life in a fallen world. Additionally, consider your wardrobe. In a very literal sense, it's as if God has, has woven this beautiful fabric and he has these amazing garments laid out in front of you. But you have to pick them up. You have to take off the old and put on the new. Finally tailored. Why? Why? I've been asking myself this week, it's like, Jason, why would you continue to wear those filthy rags when you have the beauty of what God has designed for you? I'll tell you why. Because in this moment, this moment, all other moments are contained. Kill it. The Greek word is martyreo. Kill it. I'm gonna have you bow your heads and close your eyes. This is an incredibly powerful text and it has a resonance that goes out into the future. We're about to participate in what Jesus commanded Christians to do for the last 2,000 years. The church has been doing this. If you're not a Christian, you can let this time uh, pass by you. For those who have placed their faith in J Jesus Christ, this is a remembrance of all the things that Jesus could have said, do this in remembrance of me. He said, remember my death. And then he actually goes on and he says, as often as you do this, you're actually proclaiming my death. And that sounds so morbid, but it's actually beautiful. 
because it's the death of Jesus that brings us peace with God. Therefore, we can have peace with others. We can have peace within, but not without the death of Jesus from which the wrath of a holy God has been placated. Father, as we enter into these moments, your spirit speaks. Lord, some might be near, some might be far. Some might be even skeptical. But Father, these are the spaces that you enter into all the time. You're always working. Nobody's here by accident. We pray that you would gently move and nudge in the direction that you would want us to go and that we would have the courage to put to death what is actually robbing us of our own life. In these next moments, as we reflect on the words of the screen, your scriptures, pray that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ would be very real. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.